Welcome to the fifth and final part of this lecture on the addition function blocks. Now binary addition is a very frequently used tool in embedded systems and we have these three main adders that we're going to talk about in detail in this part of the lecture. So we have the half adder which is a two input bitwise addition function. We have a full adder which is a three input bitwise addition functional block and then we also have what's called a ripple carry adder which is an iterative array to perform binary addition. The idea of the ripple carry is that as you perform the carry operation, then it ripples through the rest of the solution, potentially overflowing and causing further ripples in more significant bits. So first of all, let's look at the half adder block. And in this case, we have two inputs, X and Y, and we will have a carry and a sum as the output. So it does one bit width binary addition, and it performs the following computations. Very simply, one and one gives a sum of zero and a carry of one. Zero and one gives a sum of one, but a carry of zero. So in general, a half bit adder adds these two bits to produce a two bit sum expressed as the sum bit and the carry bit, the S and the C, and the truth table on the right shows this half adder at work. So you could think about it having a plus symbol in between here, and we say that the sum is the result of that and the carry is whether it overflowed larger than the sum. Obviously the sum can only be zero or one. So these three cases, there's no issue. The sum can be zero or one without overflowing. But on this fourth case, we have one and one giving two. And since the sum can't represent two, then it overflows into the carry column. So we get a one in the carry and a zero for the sum. So we'll create now the K maps for the S and the C outputs. I mean, super trivial, S being one for the indexes of one and two, C being one only for the index of three. We can take these min terms out. We can recognize that this is an odd function. We can represent it with the XOR. So we have X, XOR, Y, the same as product of sums in this way. And then as for the C, we have it just being X and Y, or alternatively, this double negated X and Y. And we're gonna look at several implementations of this. And hopefully the movement from the truth table to this K map does appear to you very obvious because we'll be building up on this when we get to the full adder. So we can derive the following sets of equations for the half adder. And these equations have been brought forward from the previous page. And the fact that there's various ways of writing this also shows that there's various ways to implement it. For example, A is this sum of products. We have B being product of sums, and we have E being the XOR. In C, we've actually used the C term in order to get the result for S, whereas for A, B, and E, we haven't actually included that C term, but we've rearranged the equation in such a way that we would have X, Y in here, and it can be replaced by the C equaling X, Y. For D, it's an interesting case where originally we had C equaling to X, Y double negated. Then we could say C not equals to X, Y not equals to not X or not Y because of De Morgan's theorem. And then because we've got not C equaling not X or not Y, and from here for B, we had this not X or not Y, and so we could replace that not X or not Y with a not C as we've done in D. The most common half adder implementation is E, which had the XOR gates that looks like this, and then drawn up, this is our XOR gate, X, XOR Y giving S, and C being simply X and Y. We can also take what we got from D in order to do a NAND only implementation. Remembering of course that this inverter is just a NAND gate with a single input. C itself doesn't look like it's being fed back into the circuit. Not C is actually here and it is being fed in both here and here, although it's not directly connected back. It is actually the output of this NAND gate, which of course is the inversion of X and Y, not X and Y. For the full adder, it's pretty similar to the half adder, but it also includes a carry in bit from lower stages. So whilst the half adder was only able to have a carry bit that carries it further down the line, the full adder is able to have a bit being carried in and then also an output carry. So we still have our X and Y inputs, but we also have this Z input, which is the carry in. In the case where Z is equal to zero, this is exactly the same as the half adder. In the case where Z equals to one, it's the same as the output from the half adder plus one. 
Also now both the C and the S value, the carry and the sum value, can be all combinations of zeros and ones, whereas for the half adder, the one one was never possible, no matter what the value of X and Y was. So here's the truth table for the full adder. We've got the X, Y, and the carry in Z values, just showing all combinations here. So let's fill in this K map for the S. S is equal to one in indexes of one, two, four, and seven. One, two, four, and seven. And C is equal to one in indexes of three, five, six, and seven. Three, five, six, and seven. So that answer is correct. And we'll see if we can draw some rectangles around this, to simplify it slightly. So there's no eight, there's no four, there's no two. So they're all just min terms. Whilst for the C, although we have no eights and no fours, we can actually draw three two by ones. And that would be Z not changing and X not changing, Y not changing and X not changing, and Y not changing and Z not changing. This one is the min terms. So that's the correct answer, just written in slightly different order. So the S function is that three bit XOR odd function, which we can implement in this way using the XOR gates. So X, XOR, Y, XOR, Z. And the carry bit C is one if both X, Y are one, that is the sum is two, or if the sum is one and the carry in Z is one. So C can be rewritten in this way. So that is if both X and Y, then we get a carry bit, or if we get X or Y, but not both of them, and a carry in, then that will also mean that C is one. We learn these new terms, carry generate being X and Y, and carry propagate being X, X or Y. Here's the full adder schematic. And here we're going to substitute some of the nomenclature. We're going to use the variables A and B as the inputs instead of X and Y. So X and Y is now A and B, these are the inputs. And then Z being the carry in is now CI as in carry in. And C, which is the carry out, is CO here. Also from the previous slide, we had the carry generate. We're gonna call that G output here. And we've got the carry propagate. Notice how we're using XOR gate here, here, two AND gates and one OR gate at the end. So it's really just a combination of the three bit odd function for S, which we saw before, and the carry logic for CO. This can be rewritten more formally as CO is equal to the generate, generate carry, or the propagate carry and the carry in, which was similar to our X, Y, or propagate being X, X or Y. And then we had the carry in before being Z, but we're gonna call it CI. In order to make these adders easier to use, we'll often bundle these logical signals together into vectors, and we'll use function blocks that operate on the vectors rather than just on the individual signals. An example of that would be a 4-bit ripple carry adder, which adds the three input vectors A and B to get a sum vector of S. This is why on the previous slide we started using the terminology of A and B. So then we have this vector of length 4 and another vector of length 4, and we have a sum being of length four. And so then the carry out of cell I becomes the carry in of cell I plus one. Although you will notice that if both A and B were all ones, then obviously summing those together is going to be larger than what can be output here. In the case where the index zero bit added together in the sum needs to become a carry, then it becomes a carry for the next bit over. And the operation itself is relatively straightforward. We've done this obviously even in the first week. Those binary operations can then be implemented in a relatively straightforward manner in actual circuits that we can use and we can implement on our own embedded systems. So iterative combinational circuits are arithmetic functions that operate on binary vectors, and they use the same functions in each bit position. Each by themselves is relatively straightforward, and yet when you combine them all together in a long chain or an iterative combination, then you can end up with quite powerful operations happening extremely quickly. In terms of our design process, we can design the functional blocks for just one subfunction, and then we just repeat it multiple times so that we can obtain a functional block for the overall function. So some notes on terms, we're gonna call cell as a subfunction block, and you'll see a picture on the next slide, and an iterative array is an array of interconnected cells. Here's a block diagram of an iterative array of cells. Here we have from cell zero all the way through to cell n minus one. 
each of the cells by themselves has two inputs, A0 and B0. So if we had two cells, we have four inputs. If we have, for example, 32 cells, then how many inputs do we have? Well, we'd have 64, but we also have this carry in from a previous cell. So we're gonna add those two as well, equaling to 66. How many truth table rows do we need? For each of those inputs, those inputs can be both zero or one. For one cell, we'll have two inputs. For each input, we have two possible combinations, therefore two rows in the truth table, and therefore we have two to the 66 lines, which is a massive number. And the equations with up to how many input variables? Well, once again, 66. Therefore, the equations have a huge number of terms. And so the design would be impractical if you weren't repeating some very simplified block. Therefore, we can use this idea of an iterative array to take advantage of these regular cells and to make the design more feasible. The previous slide was showing the general case. This is a more specific 4-bit ripple carry binary adder. The reason for the word ripple is it's almost as if this ripple propagates through so remembering that it goes from 0 through to n minus 1, we've got 4 bits, so b3 and a3 carry 0 all the way through to carry 4, and the outputs that we actually care about is the s0 to 3 and the carry 4. Okay, so that's the end of this lecture and the end of the combinational logic parts. In the next lectures, we're going to be talking about sequential logic. So I'll see you then.